mood of the times. 1848 was to be the year of the revolutions throughout Europe. In January, a local revolution was sparked off in Sicily. The following month saw one in Paris. Then it spread to Germany, the rest of Italy. The revolutionaries were not the only ones to think that bourgeois European civilization was coming to an end. Yet once again, Marx went his own dialectical way. Encouraged by Engels, he astonished the Communist League by turning his back on the cause. The two of them left Belgium and returned to the Rhineland, where Marx accepted the post of editor of a resurrected Neue Rhineland Zeitung. To the amazement of his friends, Marx now began writing articles denouncing the revolution. In Marx's view, it was all a mistake. Instead, the working class should collaborate with the democratic bourgeoisie if anything worthwhile was to be achieved. This unexpected dialectical shift was to be short-lived, soon generating its own dialectical conclusion. In September 1848, Kaiser Friedrich Wilhelm IV dissolved the Prussian Assembly in Berlin. This was too much for Marx, who immediately advocated armed resistance to such a suspension of democratic rights. He was arrested, but put on a bravura performance at his trial. He told the jurors that he hadn't been advocating revolution, merely a defence of the realm. The king himself had been guilty of revolution. Such was the popular feeling of the moment that Marx was unanimously acquitted and even thanked by the jury amidst a cheering courtroom. Meanwhile, the fearful bourgeois backers of the Neue Rheinische Zeitung had withdrawn their support, but Marx managed to put out a final issue. This was printed in bright red ink, with Marx announcing in his editorial that his last word everywhere and always will be emancipation of the working class. The edition caused the expected uproar, and Marx was deported. In August 1849, Marx arrived all but penniless in London, accompanied by his family, which had now increased to three small children, with Jenny pregnant once more. In a show of solidarity, he and Engels rejoined the Communist League, whose international headquarters was in London. For almost a year after their arrival in the city, the Marx family lived a hand-to-mouth existence. They moved from one cheap lodging to another in the shabbier back streets around Leicester Square, favoured by many continental political exiles. That same year, Jenny Marx gave birth to her fourth child, another son. Soon after this, the family were evicted onto the street, along with their few sticks of furniture, for non-payment of rent. They were rescued by the charity of a fellow exile, but by the end of the year, his infant son had died. More lasting charity was now provided by Engels, who had given up his attempt to become a journalist. He had gone back to work for his father's factory in Manchester, at least in part, so that he could support Marx. At the beginning of 1851. Marx and his family found more settled lodgings in two rooms on the top floor of 28 Dean Street in Soho. This was the beginning of Marx's decade-long period of oblivion, a time of spiritual and political isolation, supported by handouts from Engels, who was exiled 300 kilometers away in Manchester. The Communist League was Marx's only consolation. His charismatic and genuinely endearing personality, along with his daunting and far-ranging intellect, made him a natural leader. But his supreme political skills were best adapted to small groups, such as the newspaper office and the committee room. He had to dominate. He disliked appearing at public meetings or encountering intellectual peers who might cross swords with him. Marx found himself unable to dominate the Communist League, which soon fell apart, both in England and Germany, amidst a welter of bickering and recriminations, mostly inspired by clashes of personality masquerading as irreconcilable differences of policy. Marx's house in Dean Street was kept under permanent surveillance by Prussian police spies. He and Engels even wrote a joint letter to the Spectator, the best-known magazine in London, complaining. The doors of the houses where we live are closely watched by individuals of a more than doubtful look, who take down their notes very coolly every time one enters the house or leaves it. We cannot make a single step without being followed by them wherever we go. Somehow, one of these spies even managed to gain entry into Marx's home, leaving us the most intimate picture we have of him during this period. As you enter his room, your eyes are so dimmed by coal smoke and tobacco fumes. That it is as if you are blundering into a cave. Everything is so dirty and the place so full of dust 
that even sitting down is a hazardous undertaking. The chair on which one sits has only three legs, the only whole chairs being used by the children to play and prepare food. Besides being a poor host, Marx is also a completely disorganized and cynical person. He leads the existence of a genuine bohemian intellectual. He very seldom washes himself, combs his hair, or changes his clothes. He also enjoys getting drunk. Sometimes he is idle for days on end, but he will work day and night with tireless endurance when he has a lot of work to do. He follows no routine when it comes to getting up or going to sleep. Frequently he stays up all night, then he lies down fully clothed on the sofa at noon and sleeps until evening, oblivious to whoever passes in and out of the room. In all fairness, this chaotic regime must in part have been imposed by the fact that Marx was sharing two small rooms with a wife, three small children, Lenschen, their German maid, and presumably the odd visiting Prussian spy taking outraged notes about the scruffy bearded figure snoring contentedly on the sofa in mid-afternoon. Despite this, Marx now set himself a tireless regime of research in the British Museum. The 1848 revolution had failed and a period of severe repression had set in over Europe, causing many radicals to despair. But Marx was equipped with exceptional psychological endurance. While biding his time, he decided to work out his revolutionary ideas on paper, a task that would take him through the first long years of his isolation. Living in London, Marx was ideally situated for this task. In 1856, a superb new reading room opened at the British Museum, providing the finest research facilities in the world beneath a vast dome, whose Italian designer had ensured that it would not surpass the dome of St. Peter's in Rome by covertly reducing its diameter by a few inches. Here Marx could study Hegel and Feuerbach in the original German, and investigate in detail the works of Smith and Ricardo, as well as consulting the rows of bound parliamentary committee reports that lined the walls beside his favourite seat. Marx quickly became a familiar figure about the streets of Soho. Even in the hirsute Victorian era he stood out from the crowd, a fact only accentuated by his thick German accent which he did nothing to improve. The diet of bread and potatoes, the cheap cheroots constantly staining and fumigating his beard and lungs, the sedentary life and heavy drinking, these soon began to take their toll. He began to suffer from painful boils, a curse of biblical proportions which continued to rack his flabby frame until the end of his days. But others in the family were not possessed of such stamina, and two more of his children died in infancy. As if all this weren't bad enough, Marx also had an affair with a family maid, Lenschen de Muth, and made her pregnant. Engels, a frequent visitor, selflessly took the blame upon himself. When Lenschen was delivered of a small, dark, hirsute son, Jenny had her suspicions, but she kept these to herself for the sake of the family. Years later, on his deathbed, Engels revealed the truth to Marx's daughter, Eleanor, known as Tussie. Young Freddy de Muth would grow up to become a true member of the proletariat, working in an engineering factory in Hackney in London's working-class East End. In old age he would live to see the ideas of both his fathers come to fruition in the Russian Revolution and the establishment of the Soviet Union. Freddy's siblings were less fortunate. Marx's oldest daughter Laura would commit joint suicide with her anarchist husband while living in poverty in Paris. His favourite, Tussie, chose the same path after being rejected by her philandering lover, who even gave her the prussic acid that she drank, causing her excruciating death. Yet times were not unrelieved misery, Shea Marx. On sunny Sundays the family would travel up to Hampstead Heath for jolly picnics, with leapfrog and other party games afterward. A farcical description remains of a drinking spree which Marx embarked upon with some German friends. This ended with a student prank smashing some gas lamps with stones, followed by a dash through the night streets to elude the chasing Bobbies, the slang name for the London police, so called after Sir Robert Peel, who had created the first uniformed London police force some two decades earlier. In temperament, Marx remained very much the perennial student. As with the man, so with his ideas. This has always remained open to debate. Yet, as we shall see, no description of one would be complete without the other. Such are their echoes, parallels, and dialectical contradictions.
From all accounts, sheer fecklessness was the main contributor to Marx's persistent poverty. Engels continued to send regular money, and Marx was even taken on as London correspondent of the New York Daily Tribune, at the time the world's biggest circulation newspaper. He was contracted to write twice-weekly commentaries on British and Empire news, though these would frequently have to be dashed off by Engels in order to meet the deadline. Here, too, Marx honed his political technique. When the Indian mutiny broke out, he was asked by his editor to...